Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Scientists today are exploring whether so-called electrical sparking may occur on the moon, altering the lunar soil. The scientists have developed computer models to explore how strong electric fields might accumulate in permanently shadowed regions on the moon, creating electrical sparking that fragments soil grains. Lead author Andrew Jordan says of this research, The lunar community generally thinks that the main ongoing process of fragmenting soil grains is meteoritic impacts. Our research suggests that breakdown weathering may also contribute to this fragmenting, at least within permanently shadowed regions on the moon. However, institutional science remains unready to explore the evidence for high-scale electrical discharge events in the past that may have shaped the lunar surface. Andrew Jordan, a space physicist at the University of New Hampshire, and his colleagues explored whether high-energy electrically charged particles might penetrate deeper into the moon to produce deep dielectric charging. It's a process used to produce spectacular trapped lightning in acrylic blocks by exposing the blocks to intense radiation and then tapping the block with a sharp metal point to initiate the internal discharge. The research is aimed at explaining why the soil in craters near the lunar poles appears dark, which suggests more porous or fluffier soil than soil outside those regions. Sparking would vaporize tiny channels in lunar soil. And I quote, The lunar community generally thinks that the main ongoing process of fragmenting soil grains is meteoritic impacts. The giant craters that pockmark the face of the moon bear witness to a violent past full of cosmic impacts. End of quote. The question to be asked is, why sweat the small stuff like the soil when we don't understand the gigantic pockmarks on the face of the moon? The moon does not bear witness to a violent past of cosmic impacts. That's merely a 17th century story finally accepted by a show of hands about a century ago. Geologists won the argument with astronomers who initially attributed the craters to volcanism, about which they knew little, while the geologists who knew about volcanoes thought they were caused by impacts about which they knew little. So it seems ironic that the paper referred to appears in the Journal of Geophysical Research where planetary scientists use their earthly experience to decide what's happening in unearthly environments. And astronomers mislead them with their fabricated story of the origin of the Earth and Moon by violent impacts billions of years ago. And of course, being experts, neither group are about to listen to non-experts. Like, for instance, Brian J. Ford, a British scientific consultant and amateur astronomer, who wrote in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society back in January 1965 on the origin of the lunar craters. And I quote, There are many objections to the earlier theories. The primitive concept that meteorites would produce craters by impact was invalidated by the observation that there were no oval craters, or at least very few, and the oblique trajectory of random meteorites would certainly produce many. Gilbert and Baldwin showed that the energy of impact might be sufficient to produce surface effects similar to those of a thermonuclear explosion, no matter what the angle of arrival. Invariably, a rounded crater would be produced. However, as Professor Kopol suggested, there would be far more signs of topographical damage from the immense upheaval that this process would cause than are actually observable. It's also worthy of note that there are no examples of a large crater overrunning one of smaller diameter although smaller craters may often interfere structurally with those of larger diameters. It is impossible for any random bombardment to prove so selective. End of quote. Ford did an experiment to test electrical discharge cratering and found, and I quote, It is clear that craters produced by an electrical discharge show central peaks in the ratio of approximately 1 to 3 in the small craters, or near a 50-50 where the largest craters are concerned. This is approximate to the pattern seen on the Moon, and so this peculiar occurrence can be explained for the first time. His experiment involved plasma, arc or plasma discharge machining in a plasma oven of a surface which was then examined under a microscope. And of course, the clean circularity of lunar craters, as if they were machined into the surface rock, is characteristic of electric arcs, which always strike the surface from directly above. From Baldwin's analysis of lunar and terrestrial explosion craters, it would appear that the energy of an average terrestrial lightning bolt ought to produce a lunar crater of about 85 metres in diameter. But on to another topic. 
One of the major components of lunar soil has been found to be tiny glass beads like those used in roadside reflectors, which throw the light back in the same direction it came from. That's the reason why the moon becomes super bright close to a lunar eclipse. The origin and survival of the beads over millions or billions of years is a mystery. However, as Jordan and his colleagues are aware, lightning-like discharges in soil can vaporise and glassify the soil. A decade later, a more extensive analysis of lunar surface features was done by the engineer Ralph Jurgens, who showed, amongst many other things, that the great rayed crater Tycho doesn't conform to an impact. The rays meet the crater wall tangentially, and the rays themselves are characteristic of a Lichtenberg discharge across the surface of the Moon. Finally, returning to the report, the researchers speculate that this kind of sparking might take place throughout the solar system from Mercury to the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Here we see the planetary scientists trapped in their own mythology. Io is a living laboratory for electrical machining of a solar system body. The so-called volcanoes on Io, which have been observed to travel tens of kilometres across the surface in a few years, have all of the features of a plasma gun type discharge including the high-speed parabolic curve of the ejector to form a neat fallout ring, something no volcano can do. What's more, it's been remarked that Io looks like a pizza with its coating of sulphur. So it makes sense to suggest, since all other moons of Jupiter have copious water ice on their surfaces, that the oxygen in the water molecules on Io have been progressively fritted, that is, combined nuclear fashion, by the plasma discharge to form sulphur and the hydrogen then is lost to space. It's interesting to note in this regard that the astronauts remarked on the sulfurous, gunpowdery smell of moon dust on their spacesuits. Clearly, the interdisciplinary nature of the electric universe allows the centuries-old stories taught by and beloved by experts to be retired in favour of a really new story. It's a story that has only just begun and in which there are no experts to tell us what's impossible. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.